something about just the, the deployment, the vi the violence. I don't even know. <laughs> like, it's addicting. It's insane. Just that that adrenaline rush, fucking flying on helicopters. You know, hitting a target, taking some shit bag into custody, or doing whatever you have to do to him. Um, I don't know. Being at the top of the food chain was fucking pretty awesome. All right, Roland, what's up, Matt? How you doing, brother? Thanks for being here, man. Wow, well, happy to be here. We're just going to jump right into it, dude. Um, yeah. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself, tell us your name, uh, branch of service you served with, and the rank you got out. Uh, so my name is Matt Patch. I was in the U.S. Army, uh, Special Forces Green Beret, and I got out as uh, E7, starting first class. Awesome, man. Thank you for your service. Um, um, why don't you just talk to me a little bit about, you know, where you're from, where you were born, and what your, uh, you know, childhood upbringing was like. So I grew up in Torrance, California. Uh, actually, Gardena, Torrance, Londell. I mean, I was all over the place, to be honest. It kind of goes with my story, to be honest. <laughs> and uh, I grew up in a broken-ass family. I grew up with a father who grew up in the gang world, grew up in the drug world, you name it, you know, he was in and out of jail my entire life, um, my real dad. So I grew up with domestic violence, all sorts of shit. And it was something that I had to, I had witnessed growing up and I think it molded me, you know, overall, but still my mother, neither of my parents graduated high school. Um, my mother was a bartender for many years, taking care of me and my sister, you know, single mom. And yeah, that was, that was just my, my, my family. You know, I had a grandfather and an uncle and eventually my stepdad, you know, stepped in and took care of me and kind of helped form the man I am today, I would say, at least, you know, like my, my grandfather and my uncle were both in the military and uh, my stepdad, he's, he's a good guy and they made me the man I am today. But uh, yeah, house to house, you know, living on food stamps, you name it. It wasn't. It was an easy upbringing. Yeah. You know, but I was. I was. Had, I always had clean clothes. I always had food. I always had shelter. You know, and that's that's. Those are the things you give kids. You know, that's when you become an adult. If you had all that, it's up to you at that point. You know. So right. those are uh, those are the things that you know I was provided, and my mother did everything she could to raise us, and she did a great job. You know, looking back on it, you know, as a kid, a teenager, and stuff like that, you know, it's tough. Yeah. But. uh yeah, it was an interesting upbringing, you know. So what inspired you to go into the Army? I really didn't have a choice. Like, I had nothing. I had nothing. Um, I went to one semester of college, and I just couldn't afford it. Like, I couldn't, my family couldn't afford college. Like, everybody combined couldn't afford college, you know. Like, mm -hmm. that's how tight money was. So it wasn't anything, like, heroic at the time. You know, like there was no meaning to it. It was, I just needed to go to, like, I needed a purpose, I needed a paycheck, and I needed something that would help me with school eventually, you know, because that was, that was it, you know, you got to go to school to get a good job. And then uh, once I got in, that completely changed. <laughs> um, is there a, a, do you have any specific reason why you chose the Army over any of the other branches? Yeah, so uh, I, I met, I met, so I joined the National Guard, Army National Guard. I met a, uh, a old friend's brother. I saw him, I don't know, randomly. I don't know if it was a birthday party or something. And he had been, you know, he did that. And he's like, hey, this is a great opportunity. Like, pay, paying for me to go to school. I got to do this. I got this training, all that. And so I was like, all right, cool. This is what I'm gonna do. <laughs> like, <laughs> he sold me. We go a month later. I was in basic training. Like wow. So I was like, I, looking back on it, I think I was just desperate for cause. Like I need, I needed something. I need to do something with my life. So I was like, all right, this is it. Yeah. Um, did you get to pick your job? I did. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I came in as infantry. And I, when I said I was like, I'll take infantry, they were like, all right, easy. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> there was, there was. Like, ah, just take the ASVAB, you'll be good, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like, you don't really have to do that great. You're going to become an infantry man. So I was like, all right, I'll take infantry. Yeah, sir. Yeah. Um, where did you go to basic training at? Uh, basic training was at Fort Benning, Georgia. 
Alpha 258. I remember it. That was a, that was a definite culture shock. <laughs> like, I was, uh, I, looking back, I had a tough life, but I guess I was soft because I went to base training and I was like, holy shit, like, this is a tough life. Yeah. <laughs> like, fucking hey. But, yeah. Um. Talk to me about that. What what about it was uh was was what, what kind of things did you have to go through that kind of you know made it a culture culture shock for you? So my first time on an airplane was on my way to basic training. That was my very first time on oh, an wow. airplane. Yeah, my second time was jumping out of airborne school. <laughs> just just after basic training. Um, for me, like I don't know, I'd always I'd always had like my mom and you know my sister and my grandfather, my family, and I leaving for you know I think it was like four or five months basic training and you know uh, infantry training that was tough well, like I'd never experienced that before you know and then you know fast forward years and years later deployments after deployments like I, I loved that life I loved being gone after that but that was the first experience for me being gone and you know getting yelled at all this like mm-hmm. <laughs> Joel Sergeant Shaughnessy and London those guys were fucking awesome. Looking back on it, like, thank you for getting that, what I thought was tough at the time, bullshit out of me. You know? Right. Like, they, they. It's crazy how everybody always remembers their drill instructor, or drill sergeant's names, huh? Yep. <laughs> yeah, he called me Peaches. Peaches? Like, Shaughnessy, he called me Peaches. Hey, Peaches. I'm like, it's Petch. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. <laughs> fuck, fuck, it's Peaches. <laughs> <laughs> um... Do you remember how long it took you to adjust in boot camp to really get into the routine? Of... I mean, it was probably towards the end. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, was, it never really adjusted. I remember calling my mom on a, you know, we get to use the pay phones and call them. You get little, like, you know, back in the day, we all had them, you know, the little uh, call cards. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you call the number and then you type in the phone number you want to call. It was like minutes. I'm like, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> Kind of, I just remember that, to be honest. Right. Um, you just reminded me of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you get those minutes, you know, you call your parents and talk to my mom on the phone. I get all teary-eyed, I remember, and uh, just because I missed them. You know, I'd never been away from my home that long. Right. So I missed them. But uh, overall, great experience. Did they, uh, did they show up to your graduation? Yep. Yeah, my mother, my stepdad, my little brother... Um, my girlfriend at the time, my mom, and my uh, my grandfather all showed up. So I remember I had my black beret, you know, all excited, infantry, and then I had to stay another like month because I was going to airborne school after I graduated. So, you know, they came out for the infantry graduation, basic training graduation, and then, uh, yeah, I went to airborne school after that. Airborne school is in the same... Same place. Oh, same yeah, place? Yeah, yeah, Fort Benning, Georgia. Um, Home of the infantry... Airborne and school. Did you did you volunteer to go to airborne school, or was that just part of the being in the infantry, or how's that work? So it was a volunteer thing, but it was also based on merit, and it was based on physical fitness. So I did really well physically in basic training, and they you know they they kind of gave made it an incentive for us. They said, you know, if you perform this well, we'll give you airborne school. If you don't have it in your contract, right? Some guys had airborne infantry contracts already, or ranger. You know, airborne infantry contracts, special forces, all this. I just came in as an infantryman. Like, mm. I didn't know any of this existed because, like I said, I was one month after talking to that guy. I wasn't. I was like, all right, I just want to go into infantry. You know, get me a contract, a paycheck, and you know, some college stuff. You know, so I earned it while I was there because I figured out what it was. I was like, oh, I get to jump out of airplanes and get paid for it. I was like, oh, cool. All right, I'll do it. <laughs> you know, it's like I said, my second time on an aircraft. You know, on an airplane was uh, jumping out of it. Yeah, that's what I. That's what I was just gonna get into <laughs> next. Like, you, you know, you you're on an airplane once, and the, and so what's that like the next time? You know, while you're headed up, and you're like, well, I'm about to jump out of this fucking thing. <laughs> like, I barely remember it, and it's probably for good reason because I'm sure it was fucking insane. And yeah, you know, you have no choice. The guy in front of you is jumping. The guy behind you has to jump. So you just gotta go. That's that's what. It is jumping out of C-130, and I remember, you know, checking canopy, making sure I'm good, you know, kicking, whatever I had to untangle myself, and then it was just like, holy shit. Yeah. 
You know, I think it probably was like actually a couple of weeks later, I was like, that was my second airplane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, at the time, it's like you got to do like all these jumps while you're there. So it's, it's go time, but fuck me. Dude, is there, is there a, I mean, I mean, have you witnessed, has there ever been anybody that's up there that says, fuck this, I'm scared of heights, like that just are freaking out and yeah. they don't jump or? No, they do. Yeah. And they get kicked out. Really? If they're at the door. If you're at the door holding up everybody, you're going to get a boot to your back. Oh, you mean kicked out of the airplane? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought you meant, no, you're, you're not going. going to airborne school. You're going. If you're holding up the line, you're going. Wow. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, there's people that quit because they don't want to do that, you know. But yeah, if you're, if you're holding up the line and, you know, all the jumpers, the whole chalk, you're going to get a boot to your ass. Yeah. Um, so where did you go from uh, airborne school? Uh, so after airborne school, I went back to my unit. It was an infantry unit, and then uh, from there I went on to Special Forces. I saw these guys hanging out by the unit. They had their hands in their pockets, long hair, their boots were unbloused. I was like, who the fuck are these dudes? You know, like, that looks cool. They didn't even have fucking hats on, you know, like, they're just, like, just chilling, long hair, slick back. I was like, who the fuck are these guys? Like, my buddy's like, oh, those are the Special Forces guys. They do what they want. And I'm like, all right, cool. Like, I want to do that. Right? <laughs> I'm a fucking surfer from California, you know. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I want to, I want to have my hands in my pockets. I'm, I'm blast my boots, grow my hair out, do whatever the fuck I want to do, you know. Right. And I didn't really know what they did, so I started looking into it. And then from there, I heard about you know selection, you know the the process that goes into it. And I was like, that's what I want to do, you know. I, I proved myself in basic training. That's how I got airborne, you know, physically. I was like, I want to try the next step. I found purpose, mm. which was awesome. Right. And August 2007, I graduated with my Green Beret. Nice. Yeah. How'd that feel? It was fucking awesome. Like, one experience, you know, it's still, to this day, everything I've done in my life, besides being a father, it's my greatest achievement. Absolutely. You know, police officer, master's degree. It's, it's great, but my greatest achievement is still becoming a Green Beret. And my grandfather was super proud, you know, and my uncle was super proud. I, I've never seen either of these men cry until that day, you know. And that just shows, you know, just, I guess, how lucky I was to have them in my life and to uh, have them. <laughs> like, seeing those men in your life that proud is such a fucking feeling. It's insane, you know. Like, I can't wait to have that same exact feeling with my son with whatever he decides to do in life, you know, like, yeah, just, man, just being proud. Yeah, that's a fucking amazing accomplishment. <laughs> yeah, I was proud of it. Um, so once you finished that and uh, you became a, a Green Beret, um, wh what, what happened from there? So I graduated in August 2007. I was in Iraq in November 2007. So right away, you know, you got on the deployments. Um, we were in Iraq, we were in Baghdad, we are operating out of uh, Area 4, and it was, it was a great trip, you know, I, I was a, I was a junior, junior guy, so I did all the bitch work, and then partway through that deployment, I got the opportunity to kind of like be one of the head guys, or not one of the head guys, but like, you know, you got drivers and gunners when you become, when you first start deploying, and then you get to fucking be the guy that fucking goes in the room, and halfway through the deployment I got to be that guy and that was awesome you know I took I took that I was like let's go I want to I be a, a bigger team member than I was mm -hmm. you know we need drivers and gunners whatever it is what it is and then yeah I got home I don't know what I got home like June of that year and I was in Afghanistan six months later and then I was in Afghanistan two years later again four years later in between that, I was in Bangladesh, Africa, uh, Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia. I was all over the place. Yeah. You know, in between deployments, but you know, four combat tours, three to Afghanistan, one to Iraq. It was fun. Like, good um, life. Yeah, talk to me about that, man. A anything significant happened during any of those combat tours, or any any stories you want to bring up and talk about? I mean, if you looking at Iraq, like. There was, I mean, we we're going on missions almost every other night for six months straight. So there's a lot of shit that happened there. You know, um, March 2008, 
we went down to Basra. Basra was uh, southern Iraq, and the British had kind of owned this space. The Brit uh, army, they, they owned this, and they stepped out of this area, Hyenea, a couple other places, for like eight months. They didn't go in there um, just because, you know, whatever was going on with them, you know. They were down there, so they were overseas, you know. I, I give them the respect, but they stepped out of this area for a long time and jammed Jaysh al um, They kind of just upped their forces. So we went down there to kind of take this area back with our commandos. Our commando. And, uh, yeah, it was like two weeks of just straight firefights every day. It was fucking insane. Wow. You know, IEDs, you name it, RPGs, and just fucking just... We had hostage rescue down there of a, a police chief from the area. All sorts of shit. It was... That was a good time. You know, our, uh, our JTAC probably... Uh, probably smoked like fucking 200 people. 200 fighters, not people, you know, that were trying to kill us. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I remember when we did this hostage rescue uh, on this school and for this pol police chief. And as we're in this school, like you can just see on his, uh, his little uh, monitor, you can just see guys like kind of running in and he's literally dropping bombs around his danger close, you know, as he's calling it out like, hey, dropping danger close, you know, take cover, boom, boom, boom. Because guys are surrounding us, you know, it's like, if you look at, you know, like for the average guy, like, look at the movie, like, 13 hours, it was the same shit, you know, we were at the school doing this hostage rescue, and, uh, yeah, he was just dropping bombs everywhere, and that was super fun. And then after that, I mean, yeah, I went to Afghanistan 2009, January 2009, stayed there till August. That was fun. That was, uh, that was probably the best team. I've ever served with, to be honest, you know, like no, no discredit to any of the other teams I've been on, but like those were the guys, like that was some solid dudes. Like three of the guys I actually went to the course with and graduated with and, you know, a couple guys there were my mentors that have shaped me into who I am, you know, and who I was in the military. And that was a good trip. We, uh, we were right there on the Pakistani border and Shkin, Afghanistan, Firebase Lily, that was uh, Paktika province, so southeast Afghanistan. We're, we're a rocket distance from the border, as I say, because we used to take rockets all the time from Pakistan, from the Taliban. And then we'd, you know, go down to the border, get on a Barrett 50 cal and start fucking firing rounds back. And we had some artillery guys with us that would send rounds back and, you know, take care of that threat for us. But that was a cool trip. You know, like, uh, like I said, it was a good team. Uh, we worked with Commander Aziz. Commander Aziz was pretty much, I think he ended up becoming the governor of Paktika province. He was the warlord in Afghanistan, I think. And I think a lot of people who worked with him and worked in Afghanistan and special forces would agree. Like, he was the guy. Like, yeah, he, he did what he had to do to, he didn't give a shit. Yeah. Bottom line, like, he was a fucking warrior. He was assassinated, you know, uh, years back. But I worked with him in 2009, and I worked with him again in 2016. Like, you know, a seven-year time span. I worked with him once, and I worked with him again. And that wow. was fucking amazing. Yeah. Um, just to see the progress and just, just thinking of that, you know? Like, I worked with the same, you know, military commander twice. Like... We deploy for six months, a year, a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And we come back here. And these people were still fighting a war. Well, you know, we're in between war, you know. Right. They were fighting a war the entire time. And, uh, you know, like I said, he got assassinated. And you know, I did three trips to Afghanistan. You know, all of them were great. And I did a lot of good stuff. 2011, I don't really talk about because it's still, like, classified. But, you know, 2016... Yeah, worked with Z's, lost guys. Wasn't the best trip, but it um, is. Going back to the uh, the 2009, I think that's the one that you said you mentioned was one of the most solid teams you've been with. Um, what would you say made it uh, uh, the most solid team? It's the guys. 
I had, I had the best fucking team members. Like, these guys were warriors. I'm like, I don't know, I'll, I'll just... Brandon, John, Eric Emon, you know, um, Luke. They were good guys. I had good medics, Martino. Um, I don't know, these guys are just fucking warriors. They are warriors. Like, it's like, it's like, you know, you always think, you know, like, if I, if I had to, like, ask anybody to get my back for any reason alone, you know, or who, who would you go to war with, you know, those are the guys I wanted to go to war with. And they still are to this day, you know. Half of us are out, half of us are still in. Um, they were just solid guys. Like, they are in peak physical fitness. They fucking loved to train. Um, and they were just down for the mission because sometimes the mission goes off of what it's supposed to be, you know, and these guys, we looked out for each other. It is what it is. Yeah. Um, did you ever lose anybody while you guys were out there? Yeah, yeah. We lost uh, Partner Force that trip, 2009, you know, and uh, previous trips. I lost guys that were Afghani, but they're like our brothers. Like, we worked with them. You know, and then fast forward 2016, um, Doug Riney and we had uh, some kids we worked with on our base. They were infantry guys or whatever. They were support guys. They were supporting our mission, though, for the most part. Um, they got ambushed just outside the gate. And I remember, you know, oh, it fucking sucked. Like, working on them, like, and all that. And... Because, like, we're the SF guys. We looked to us at this base that we were at. And it was like, uh, you know, we had to do all the triage and all this. And these are kids that we had been, like, you know, they wanted to go special forces. They looked up to us, you know. So, like, we had been mentoring them through the whole trip. And, you know, just outside the gate, they were going just to do an ammo run. That's it. And, like, same shit they did every day. Same shit. They did it for us. And, you know, they got ambushed by some Afghani soldier who... Obviously, I'd, you know, been a part of the Taliban, been waiting to have that opportunity. And, uh, yeah, we, we, was, the anniversary was just on the 19th. He, uh, yeah, I mean, kid died in my arms for the most part, you know, while we're working on him, trying to get him back. But, uh, yeah, and then again, you know, 20, what, what fucking, uh, 17, um, 18, so I can not fucking remember right now, but Eric Iman, you know, was killed in an IED, you know, was a good team member of mine, you know, years later, but yeah, it happens as part of the job, I guess. How do you, um, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, you got a fellow soldier, you know, basically dying in your arms how, how do you how do you move on from that how do you set aside those emotions because uh you still have a mission uh to complete um how do you work through that or how do you work through that while we're deployed you you take you take i guess for me i remember calling my wife at the time um, I just opened up to her, you know, I fucking cried, and I got my emotions out. I had my own episode in my sh in like the shower in my room, you know. I got all the emotions out. But when you're deployed, at the end of the day, you still have a job to do, and you still need to, you still need to fucking stay alive to get back to your family, you know. And that kind of brings when you lose somebody, it kind of brings it to reality. You're like, fuck, I could fucking die. And you kind of got to shake it off, you know, and I, sh I had shaken it off. That was my last deployment, 2016. Um, I'd shaken it off all the other deployments because I still was working. And after 2016, I decided that, you know, it was time for me to possibly get out in a few years. And I got out in 2019. Um, yeah, you, uh, you shake it off while you're there, but fuck does it hit you sometimes 
2017 was probably one of the worst years of my life when I, I wanted to kill myself. You know, I was depressed. PTSD is a real thing. It fucking hit me. I thought I was tough as shit. It hit me. And then my son was born, and thank God he was, because he probably saved my life. I, I had purpose again, you know? And you were out at this at this time? No, I was in the guard, so like I was, I just wasn't deploying at this mm. time. You know, I uh, I was just doing you know my normal job. I was training, doing whatever. But I was kind of in the mindset already that I'm getting out again. Like I'm getting out before I deploy again. Put it that way. Like I was done. Like all the deployments had finally caught up with me, and my mental state was bad. Like I was suffering mentally. And, you know, severe alcoholism, like I said, suicidal thoughts, all that, it, it fucking hit me bad. And, you know, that's how I lost my marriage. Like, you know, it's, I, it ruined my personal life, everything. And then, yeah, physical fitness kind of brought me out of it, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Man, I'm 100% on board uh, with you with that. You know, that's... Uh, that's why I work out as much as I do is specifically for that. And, um, you know, I, I'm curious, um, Matt, what, what do you think it is, man, uh, on, you know, after doing those deployments and getting out and, you know, you're able to work through it while you're still in and go on mission after mission after mission and you're just, you know, you're alive and, and you're doing well and you're completing these missions. But as soon as that stops, um, it's a different story. And, uh, you know, I'd like to hear your thoughts on why do you think that occurs? Because uh, it's it's common, especially in combat veterans. Let's say, like I don't know, like it's 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 what you know, and at the end of the day, like we talked about, you know, prior to going live here, is when I was deployed, those are the best days of my life. Those are the best days of my life because I don't know, it was just purpose. It was brotherhood. It was routine all that stuff that i i didn't really have it was a new family for me you know um and the sense of purpose the sense of brotherhood that that is huge and to this day i still live you know with those values you know all the values i learned through the military still are carried and i still try to like you know teach my kids and teach my brothers, the veterans I work with, the same values, um, that brotherhood. It's, it's, I don't know. And then something about just like the deployment, the, vi the violence, I don't even know. <laughs> like it's addicting. It's insane. Just that, that adrenaline rush fucking flying on helicopters, you know, hitting a target, taking some shit bag into custody or doing whatever you have to do to him. Um, I don't know. Being at the top of the food chain was fucking pretty awesome. Yeah, um, you're right, man. This, uh, you know, I, I, I think it has something to do with um, going on these missions. Is almost like, uh, almost like being a drug addict, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you, you want that uh, adrenaline again. You want, you want that surge of adrenaline, and I'm going on these dangerous missions. Like you thrive off of that. At least from my experience. Yeah. From the, people that I've been around and served with and stuff and from what I've done and um and then you get home and you know there's really there's no more missions <laughs> yeah. you know and 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 now all of a sudden you uh you have to drop the hypertension and uh, there's no reason to be anxious um you know there shouldn't be a reason to be anxious but obviously after having been through all of that like you, you have a you have a reason to be anxious um yeah a lot of the depression and, you know, I've talked to guys and I've done my research and worked with organizations. A lot of the depression that comes to these guys that had high op tempos, you know, special forces, rangers, whoever, um, or just infantry, whoever it's put on missions, like, when you lose that and you come home and you have nothing, that takes a fucking toll. It takes a toll on you because you're used to go, 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 this, this, this level of work. And then you get home, you know, where you have to take care of your kids. You have to get back to your wife. You got to fill up your truck with gas. You got to go to the grocery store, shit like that. That's, that's not the same feeling. It's worse. It fucking sucks. I don't want to do any of that. Right. You know? Um, 
And we were talking earlier, uh, you know, about combat and stuff and, you know, it not being all just gun battles and, you know, uh, G.I. Joe shit. And, and I, I had mentioned to you that I came across a story on your social media um, about you guys jamming out, <laughs> having a little concert out in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Um, would you mind talking, I mean, walking us through that? Yeah, so that was 2009. That was a dream team. Um, that was with Commander Aziz. And we had, uh, it, was towards, it was towards the end of the deployment. It was one of, their, one of their holidays. I can't remember which one exactly. But they invited a, like one of, one of a, the famous bands from the area, you know. Um, he said it was the most famous band in Afghanistan, but, you know. <laughs> I don't know if it really was, but yeah, they, came, they, they came to the uh, base and we all dressed up, you know, in traditional um, Afghan clothing, and we ate Afghan food with them. You know, we immersed ourselves, which we did often immerse ourselves, you know, and dressed in their clothing, but this was like a party. This is a, a family event, you know, people brought their families, um, or their, their sons for the most part, because this is how it is over there. Um, and there was music and dancing, like, I mean, I was dancing in a circle with a group of men, you know, like yeah. something I wouldn't do here. Like guys here aren't going to dance in a circle, you know, with <laughs> other guys, but you know, this is their tradition. This is their culture. And, you know, we embraced it. That's, that's, I'm thankful that I joined special force because I, the cultural aspect and the immersing ourselves with locals, that is, just, that has developed me as a, a human being. Like we immersed ourselves, we embraced their culture. And, you know, that night they had this, this, the best Afghan band in the in the country, you know, in the world, <laughs> and uh, they're up there playing, and I, I don't I even know how it happened. I think one of my teammates was like, "Oh, you know, Pet should play with you guys. You know, he has a guitar in his room." They're like, "Go get your guitar," you know, like through the interpreters. And I went got my guitar, and I came back, and I played some Leonard Skinner, and. <laughs> <laughs> like, they just started jamming with me. <laughs> I was nice. like, hey, let's fucking go. <laughs> like, I mean, how many people can say they played, you know, acoustic guitar with an Afghan band in Afghanistan in a war zone during war? That's like, fucking badass. And, dude. you know, we all kind of, you know, set aside, you know, what our mission was for the night and had a good night. That was, it was awesome. Like, I, I, Eric was there, you know, like I look back on the pictures and I see, you know, just like. I don't know, I just, some, some, some bit of innocence that night that, you know, we, we all have in us still, you know, that joy, you know, to see these guys that are dealing with death and dealing with combat to just have a fucking smile, you know? I look back on these pictures and they make me smile still to this day. Like, that was yeah. a fun night. Yeah. You know, like, you know, we all, we dressed up. Like, yeah. guys don't dress up, you know? Like, we dressed <laughs> up and... Yeah, I don't know, it makes me happy. No, it gives me the fucking chills, man, because to me, it's like you guys chose to like enjoy that fucking moment, right? Something that a lot of people struggle with um, today, with enjoying the present. And you guys were in a war zone, um, probably had more missions to complete, um, already completed some, and you guys just chose to say... We're gonna fucking enjoy this time right here. We're not thinking about any of fuck any of that right now, and uh, I feel like that—that's what might have made it special for you. Yeah, it was awesome. It was a great time. Like many people that were there that night aren't with us today, you know. Like, so it's just a good memory. Yeah. Um. um speaking of more combat, you were talking to me about. Um, you were talk, telling me a wild story earlier about this rock landing uh, <laughs> uh, in, what was it that you guys were in? Uh, it landed in the back of the Humvee. Yeah, with the yeah, message ID. Can yeah, you yeah. walk us through that yeah. story? This is it right here. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so this, this rock came from, I'm guessing, a giant stone. Um, that had an IED underneath it, and 2009, this is, uh, I've talked about this before, I wrote about it as well, this is, uh, this was a big day, because this is the day that Eric got sent home, Eric Emond, and uh, this rock was in the back of the Humvee that he was in that got hit by an IED, and 
knocked him unconscious. So we had a Spadar Pass was a it was a shit show. It was this this pass we had to take as we traveled north in Paktika Province, and it was surrounded by mountains. So high ground in both both areas. So it was ambush alley. Like it was every time we went through, we got ambushed. Bottom line, you know. And this time we kind of prepped for it. We're like, all right, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna put a vehicle, my vehicle, um, up on uh, this mountain. Let this truck get this far. And they're gonna pull up on this mountain. Let us go this far. Kind of like you know, bounding an Overwatch with vehicles, but getting that high ground uh, rather than just pushing through. And we also had you know another. Get, you know, fuck, I probably had like 10 vehicles total, you know, but that was kind of the plan. You know, we're going to drop a few off here, there, there, and there. Um, so I'm in the, I'm in the, I'm in the rear. We pull up and uh, we get this high ground. We're watching this, this place, this area, this village that we think the Taliban is coming to this area to attack us out of. So we have the overwatch on the village, you know, no activity, blah, blah, blah. And... All of a sudden, you just start hearing gunfire and fucking the radio's going off. Boom, 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 boom. Da, 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 da. You know, IEDs, RPGs, everything. It, it's just, they're all specific sounds. If you know them, you know them. And they're all going off. And we're like, fuck. Like, we're out of the fight right now. Like, what the fuck is happening? So we get back in the vehicle and we catch up to everyone else. And on the way, we hear Eric's down, Eric's down. Um, you know, so like you know, the worst, the worst thoughts come into to mind. You know, you know, Eric's down. You never want to hear one of your teammates is down. And uh, we get there, and you just get in the fight. It's a three hundred sixty degree ambush. We're getting attacked from all sides. RPGs, AKA fucking SKS, whatever it is. Like we're just getting attacked, fucking from everywhere. Um, and we're just we're, we're firing back. You know, like shit. I remember I was like hanging out at the top of the MRAP with a fucking law, you know, the old fucking tube. I'm like fucking sitting there like out of the top of the MRAP. I'm, I'm fucking, I'm gonna shoot this fucking law at somebody. Like these motherfuckers are gonna die. And I get out, I fight the law at a uh, bunker. And then, you know, back in the fight. And fucking Eric, he, he ain't down. Eric is not down. Eric got knocked unconscious from the initial IED, you know. And he. Yeah, knocked unconscious in the turret. He was on a 50 cal. Who, the person who was in the back of the um, Humvee, there was a Mark 47 there, which is an uh, automatic grenade launcher. He thought he was hit. He climbed in the back of the, uh, the Humvee. I'm not going to discredit him more than I have already because it's, it's uh, I don't know, like, he did some things that we weren't proud of that day, you know? Um, not taking care of your brothers. He wasn't a special force guy. He was a dog handler. But he left the gun, climbed in the back, and uh, Eric wakes up, unloads his 50 cal at these people who are trying to kill us, climbs over the top of the Humvee, gets on the Mark 47, unloads that automatic grenade launcher into the fucking mountains, Reloads it, unloads it again, climbs up to the 50 cal, reloads that, unloads that again, and just fucking back in the fight. And he's back in the fight, and he's he's in trouble. Like, his brain is in trouble. Like, he's been blown up, the overpressure and everything, you know, and he ended up being medevaced um, and sent home that, that day because of, you know, how it affected him. And it took him years and years and years to get back into the fight to where he eventually got back into the fight because he wanted to. You know, he could have left. He got a great retirement, you know, but he wanted to be in the fucking fight. He was one of those warriors. He wanted to be in the fight. And that's ultimately, you know, where it ended for him. But that's what he wanted. He's a fucking warrior. Wow. That's crazy to be like, knocked unconscious and then get back up and do all that, man. Mm-hmm. That's a... Uh... While taking gunfire, he's climbing over the top like, holy shit. <laughs> right. Um, so what, how, where did this rock come into play? So this was, uh, I, I, we think it was part of the IED. 
So when the ID went off, this landed in the back of the truck. When we got back to base after he was medevac and everything, we were cleaning up the trucks because, like we talked about earlier, life goes on. You know, we still have missions to do. We still have shit to do. So clean up the trucks, get them ready for the next mission. This is in the back of the truck. This is sitting there with a bunch of other rocks, you know, like, you know, small pebbles and stuff like that and all sorts of shit, all blown to shit. And this was sitting there. And yeah, it said, you will accept the Taliban. Um, That's what it said? Yeah. You mind holding it up? Yeah. Just fucking. Wow. Yeah, this is a. Uh, and I wanted to bring it to Eric while he was in the hospital. Just, to, you know, just kind of. Like, just, I don't know, just. It's one of those things, war trophies, I guess, you know, like, hey, you survived this. You know, and, and I didn't, this wasn't put back in my hands until Eric passed away because who I gave it to held on to it. Um, so now I hold on to it, and now um, I tell the story. Mm. So it's an amazing story, man. <laughs> um, wow. Well, uh, it's it, it's because of him. It's because of of uh, warriors like him. Is is you know uh, that makes our country the way it is, right? Like you know, absolutely. I mean, there's like, there's a lot of guys just like him. Yeah, and you know that's why I love to do this. Like I love to tell the story because I want my son to know like these men, like their story needs to live on. Bottom line, like um, somebody recently told me, you know, like you die twice, you know, you die once physically, and then you die the last time somebody says your name, you know. So we'll, we won't let them die that second time. We're going to keep saying their name. We're going to keep telling their story. Bottom line, no matter who they are. Absolutely. 100% fucking agree with that, man. That's why That's why you're sitting here today. This is yep. why the fuck I'm doing this. Just yep. for that fucking reason, dude. Yep. Um, I kind of want... Um, I want to get into um, some of the things you, you're doing now, man. It seems you're like you're real fucking active. And, um, you know, I, I, I want to say it's probably... Uh, be real purposeful for you and helping you manage PTSD and stuff, everything that you've been through and dealt with. And um, can you talk to us about some of the things that you're doing for vets? Yep. Uh, we talked earlier about, you know, physical fitness, how that helps me mentally. It helps me mentally, like, immensely. Um, but, you know, I, I, I have a company called the Operational Athlete, and I train veterans. I work with veterans. I work with the vet community and get them ready for whatever they're doing, whether it's Guys who want to join the military, guys who are in the military, guys who want to go further in the military, or guys who are out. Um, I run a Veteran Tuesday workout. It's not just Tuesdays anymore. It's kind of like whenever we uh, get together. But I, I, I train the vets weekly, and then I am the founder of a nonprofit called Ruck for Vets that we've been operating since 2017. And we get together and we do a Ruck March, you know. And for us as vets, like, we understand what Ruck March is, you know, but like, I get everybody together it's not just vets it's community i want people to understand that you know i want vets to understand that people support them so we do these ruck marches and we get everybody involved and we start together we finish together and we just had one in texas we raised you know thirteen thousand five hundred dollars for the green beret foundation you know who i have friends who have benefited from you know before and uh yeah, we should be, you know, the nonprofit should be completely done by the end of the year. We were more of a fundraising element prior, and now we're going to start working on working with vets who are suffering from mental health issues, you know, and kind of bringing on that physical element of it that's helped me, helped us, you know, um, overcome some of that, you know, that stress and depression, anxiety, whatever it is, through physical exercise, rucking or whatever it is. And then also just working with homeless vets, kind of try to give them that purpose again, you know, try to give them that brotherhood that they had when they were in, you know, because they, they were in, you know, maybe they're living in other cars or on the streets now, but at some point these guys were working in a team, in a platoon, in a squad, whatever. They were part of an element and trying to give that back to them is going to be super important, you know, because if we can bring them back to, you know, I guess a more structured life, great. But if not, we're still going to give them that brotherhood. Bottom line. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Um, 
you know, most people look at working out like, you know, I, I'd say, and I didn't look this up, I'm just fucking spitting shit out of my mouth, but um, I'd say most people that work out do it, you know, to look good, right? Because mm-hmm. um, they want to look good in their clothes and, um, you know, shit like that, right? Um, but in the community, in the veteran community, it seems like um, there's a different purpose for it. And it seems like you're onto it, you know, big time. And, uh, you know, what do you think it is about, you know, physical exertion that helps your mental state of mind? I don't know. I mean, some, some will say it's, it's the endorphins or whatever. For me, um, it's a way, it's a way for me to relieve that stress for me to relieve that anger, um, to just put it all, put it all out there, you know, going like pushing yourself past what it is. You know, some people work out, like you said, for aesthetics, like just to look good. And like, I work out and when I work out, I push myself past my limits because I need that feeling to get past my limits. I need to be alpha again, you know, like I need something more than just your normal bicep curl. I want to, I want to feel like I'm fucking dying and get through it. Cause that feeling afterwards, like, I know marathon runners and, and people who do races and shit like that experience this. You know, when you finish something that is so challenging and you're done with it, like the, the feeling you get is, it's happy. I don't know, it's happiness. Um, and there's a bunch of scientific terms behind it, whatever, but I don't know, fucking happy is an easy word for me. Yeah. It makes me happy when I'm done smoking the shit out of myself and training with my brothers and stuff like that. We all feel good you know yeah 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 it's that it's that struggle right that putting yourself through that fucking suck Mm -hmm. right and 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 then and then making it out and and knowing that you fucking gave it a hundred percent because i'm sure there's times there's times that i've have i got out do the workout and i maybe gave it 60 70 percent and you don't get the same type of feeling right you're like i could have fucking i could have put more into that right there you know what i mean (laughs) let's go again (laughs) yeah exactly right um well that's awesome man um, we're getting ready to wrap it up, dude. Um, uh, is there anything we missed, man, that you want to talk about or say uh, before we cut the tape? You know, so as far as the story goes, no, but I will say this, you know, for my vets and for my families of vets and my friends of vets and stuff like that is you have to constantly keep us in mind, bottom line, you know, like shoot us a text send us a voice message, whatever it is, call us. Um, Take care of your vets because you never know what they're truly going through at all times. And, you know, we talked about it. It could be guys who deployed or didn't deploy. It doesn't matter. Like, it's it's just a different lifestyle. When you leave that lifestyle, it's tough. When you leave anything that you're used to, it's tough. You know, Um, so love your vets. Take care of them. Talk to them, tell them you love them, and that's it. Let's you know that the the suicide rate is way too high when it comes to veterans, police, first responders, everything. So I guess just just don't take uh t- don't take any time for granted, and uh, you know just take care of each other. That's it. Awesome, man. Um, and then we'll just finish with this. Uh, you know. How's it feel to sit down and tell your story? I know you've done it. I know you've been on podcasts and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, you know, you say you like saying it because maybe, it, it, you know, I. it's been therapeutic for a lot of veterans that have taken the seat and, and told their story. And I'm just um, curious on um, what it's like for you. Uh, that's amazing. I, uh, I love telling my story. Like it, it makes me feel good physically. I'm, I'm, this, this is a good day for me, you know? And... You know, I told you this earlier, if this has the opportunity to help one person, then it was completely worth it. 100% agree, man. Hey, uh, Matt, thanks for your fucking service, brother. Thank You're you. a bad motherfucker, dude. Thank you, Appreciate you, man. Um, thanks a lot. Push it to the limit, I can't go no more. Red light, no way I'm coming back home. Long dirt road all on my own. I'm going to be the greatest, try my name.